Welcome everybody to TAB Group's Fixed Income 2017 conference. We're here today with Mike Beatty, who's the Director of Product Management for Charles River Development. Mike, in this era of uh, vendors helping their clients through technology, venues disappearing, merging on a daily basis, what are some of the ways that technology can help the buy side navigate this environment? Yeah, thanks Dale. Um, so there's a number of different ways we look at this. One is it's bridging the gap. Technology really helps bridge the gap in a few different places. The first is around connectivity. But the second, and more importantly, is really around the interaction of the different trading models and normalizing some of that data. And so when you think about that and when you consolidate all of that down, there's a few different things that we can do. The first is if you're looking at 99 or 100 different venues, well, technology plays a very important role there in that normalization process. And when you think about the number of venues, the fact that there's 99, we really think about trading models. And so if you take this back and you look at, from a product perspective, how you centralize that down, at the end of the day is really four trading models, I think. The first is the request for quote. You see that, I think, predominantly. The second, second is a page almost out of the equity book where you see some central limit order books. Mm -hmm. The other is crossing our auction. And then the last piece of it is really click to trade. And so what we've tried to do is think about from a technology standpoint, how do we summarize that down and make it easier for a trader? How can a trader not have to worry about 99 different screens, but instead really normalize it down and look at some of that data? And so to make it easier and more efficient for both the venues as well as some of the traders, we've taken that data in. And then to start to look at that and think about how we route and make routing decisions or actually how we take the data back in for best execution is a core piece of this. So you mentioned data and obviously the move to electronic uh, trading for the OTC markets is going to generate a whole slew of new data uh, mm -hmm. that needs to be reported on and, and compliant. What challenges do you see the buy side dealing with in terms of all of this data? Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, data is key. And so the original theme we talked about is the number of venues. Right. The reason why data is key, I think, is there's three overarching reasons. The first is if you look at the regulatory environment between MIFID and right. Europe and between what's going on in the U.S., a lot of these regulations are pushing for more data and reporting that data. The second is actually looking at the asset class itself, right, and thinking about comparing that and contrasting it to other asset classes. If you think about equities, you have it a little bit easier, right? If you look at the 8,000 NMS securities. Relatively. Relatively, yeah. yes. There's other complexities there. But then when you think about the asset class and the breadth of the asset class for fixed income, the amount of data and analytics that surround that create all this data. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, in looking at some of that, centralizing some of that down and consolidating that data is, is, is a key part. Um, is a key you know, challenge that we think that the buy side needs to meet. And so what we tried to do there is look at the different types of data, inventory data, look at axes, runs within inventory, look at quote data, look at executable prices, think about it in the context of, of, of best execution, and then roll all of that up together. So what do you see um, in terms of the buy side's readiness for, I know you mentioned MIFID II um, specifically, how do you see them preparing and how are technology vendors helping their clients become prepared and more compliant. Yeah, so, so MIFID is interesting for a number of reasons. When you look at the impact that it has, especially in the fixed income space, is a real market structure impact. And we take it in two different areas. One is looking at generally what the directive is talking about. The other is looking at the client base, the buy side client base. You know, what we found is we know the folks in Europe know the impact generally. But what we haven't seen is in, in the U.S., not all of our clients are really coming up to speed on it. So part of what we've talked about is looking at the directive, breaking that down into a few different areas and taking, all right, well, here's the transaction reporting side of it. Here are the implications around that. There's a trade reporting piece of this. And then most importantly, there's the best execution piece of it. So in breaking each one of those different areas down, the transaction reporting is one of the biggest. And if you compare it again to the equity space, it's similar to what you see in the US space with OATS reporting or CATS reporting. There's a number of different fields. It's both the buy side and the sell side. So getting our customers ready for that is key. Making sure we capture all the data, interacting with the sell side in the right way, I think is key. The second piece of it is thinking about trade reporting, right? And so in looking at that market structure change, there's liquidity classifications within liquid instruments there's SSTI and LIS classifications taking all that data in and understanding the interaction that customers might have to have with SIs with systematic internalizers and when they actually need to report that's another thing where we think that they need help and then the most interesting I think of all of them is the best execution um, requirements and looking at the directive there there's some very specific things like re reporting the top five venues at the end of the year but there's some more higher level pieces of it and, and, and the directive itself really references a few different areas. The first is it looks at 
putting together controls over your execution quality and the framework that you use, and actually talks about the output of the consolidated tape, how you would use that. And so it's clear that, at least from our perspective, that you know the directive is, is, is taking you beyond that three-quote rule. It's saying, I want to look at prices, I want to look at the interaction in the marketplace and take all that data in and have a very consistent and uniform way of approaching that. And so in general, I think wrapping up each one of those three areas and then talking to our customer base and talking to both the U.S. and the European customers, mm. that's where we've really tried to bridge some of the gap. What are you seeing in terms of readiness? What's your sense? You know, I think, um, you know, I think in the European space, we've been talking about it for a while. So we've had a number of conferences there and we've gotten some great some great questions and then we're digging in. I think between the fixed interaction and some of the fixed community and talking about that and then in talking to, to both the sell side and the buy side, we think there's a lot of folks that are ready, at least for the core pieces of it, for transaction reporting um, and, and in some cases trade reporting. Mm-hmm. The best the best X piece of it is a little bit more amorphous in that different clients and different size clients are in different places. And so our next big push and where we think we can really help the most is in the U.S. space, talking to those large multinational customers about the impact that it's going to have on their trading and their interaction. And the midsize, I'm sure, as well. Yeah, you know, I think I think it's the smaller and the midsize guys that, that we really have to dig into. The, the so larger too. folks that have a mainstay in Europe, I think they're in a, a, a better place and talking about some of this stuff. So, Mike, putting on your your magic hat, Okay. how do you see the, the fixed income uh, market structure evolving over the next three to five years. Right, so I think there's a few different things here. You know, when I look at where technology plays a role, like we've talked about, it's the glue. The OEMS is the glue. And so, you know, we wrote an article a few months ago about a three legged mm-hmm. stool and, and the, the transactions and the changes in the marketplace and the evolution of all these new venues that are in place. The fact that the legs of the stool are customers, they're dealers, and that they're venues or buy side firms as opposed to customers. And the OEMS acting as that glue. And so, when you look at the way the markets have, have been evolving, and, and this is the case, I guess, agnostically across asset classes really, as markets evolve and get more mature, they go through this interim stage where there's these pockets of liquidity and the OEMS serves as that glue. It's not an area where you can go and find that liquidity in different places. We have to normalize that down. It really comes back to some of the themes we've been talking about. It's connectivity, but it's normalizing the data and it's using that data in the context of a feedback loop both for pre and for in-trade and interactions. And so, you know, where I see this going longer term is using the data, creating analytics and helping that analytics with a trader, even if they're using the phone or with an electronic routing, you know, sort of mechanism. And what some of our more advanced customers are doing, frankly, is they're actually looking at the data and thinking about inflection points. And, you know, one example is if I'm receiving these orders, where does it sit across the curve? You know, what is the inflection point between when I trade it manually or when I trade it electronically? And actually digging into that electronic space and making that interaction more efficient, that's where I think the market is starting to evolve. And on top of that, it's multi-asset. And so having an OEMS and thinking about not just fixed income, but those blurring lines, Mm -hmm. if you look at the sell side and what's happening, you're seeing some equity folks take over fixed income. You're seeing fixed income take over equities. And, you know, I'm careful when I make that reference because I don't think that the asset classes are are that similar. But I do think the way that the market structure evolves from manual to electronic, we can learn from that. And I think using that data and reacting efficiently. So there will be some benefit to the industry, obviously, of all this transparency and... You know, I, I think so. Extra data for analytics. I think so. And, and you know, yeah. selfishly as a technology provider, you know, we, we want to find ways to make it more efficient for our customers. And so the regulations create that data, but we think there's a step beyond that, that we can give them an advantage by looking at some of this data and thinking about uh, what's, you know, what's the classification on the MIFID side? Is it liquid? Is it not liquid? Who's registered as an SI? Um, what are the LIS and SSTI boundaries that they have to look at? And so, you know, if you use the data the right way and you consolidate it, yeah, I, I do think there's an advantage there. Definitely. Mike, thanks so much for coming to talk to us today. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Um, It was great to hear from Mike Beattie, Director of Product Management at Charles River Development. I'm Dale Scher, Senior Analyst at Tab Group. We'll see you next time.